Power outages, burst pipes, and now boil water advisories across Texas as another storm has the Northeast in its sights today. Dr. Fauci wades into the school reopening debate in a Mars touchdown. It's imminent. Thursday need to know. Let's go. Good morning, everybody. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for February 18th. I am Carlo Versano here once again with my good pal, Baker oh, Machado, yes. joining us from Cheddar HQ in Lower Manhattan. Baker, what's happening? Carlo, good to see you as always, my friend. Happy Thursday morning. Uh, yeah, Cheddar headquarters has been a little quiet for the last, uh, oh God, year or so, Carlo. I think I've collectively <laughs> yeah. seen as many people I could count on one hand over the course of the last year enter this office. Jill's telling me that she, uh, she's basically taken over my desk, oh, um, which is yeah. fine. Jill has, basically, Jill has basically taken over like an entire floor at this network. She has booby trapped everything. So if anybody <laughs> like walks downstairs, she knows. She knows if you've been down there. Jill Jill's taking the coronavirus extremely seriously. Oh, yeah. And I I appreciate that. Totally. Um, but yeah, you do you do not want to cross Jill Wagner. Oh, let's just no, put it absolutely that way. no. No, I've <laughs> learned my lesson in the past, Carlo. Uh, Carlo, let's dive into a lot of news that we're, follow, we're following today. And we got to continue for the third straight day. Uh, about what's happening down south. The number of people without power now in Texas is down to about a million. This as another round of winter weather is adding to the misery that we're seeing in the Lone Star State, where residents are under a boil water advisory. And even if they can access their tap water at all, they're basically still on that boil water advisory. Most of Texas will remain below freezing, at least now through tomorrow. The cascading effects of the grid failure in Texas are also apparent in the global oil market as well. We're seeing crude uh, prices of crude at now at a 13 month high. This is the weather has knocked out a full 40% now of the U.S. production. Uh, the big question now, Carlo, is how much of um, the people who work uh, in the power grids and monitor the power grids in Texas, how much of this could have been prevented? Should they have done cascading, rolling blackouts for a few weeks to prepare for something like this? Is this a moment for us and the rest of the country to figure out ways that we basically don't uh, have this happen at other places throughout the country as well? I think I saw the mayor of Texas yesterday say, or of Austin, Texas saying, if you have power right now in Texas, run it low. And if you're running it low, run it even lower. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I, I was sort of, uh, Becky was looking on Instagram of some people she follows in Texas and it's, I mean, it's serious. Like so serious. Yeah, I, I, you sort of get the sense that this is one of those slow moving catastrophes where we're not really going to know the full impact until we can get the power back on, um, and, and sort of hear from folks on the ground there. But again, I mean, you asked, you know, whether this could, could, could have been prevented. I, I, I sort of said, as I said this yesterday, but the answer is pretty obviously yes. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no reason that uh, in the wealthiest country on earth that millions of people should be under boil water advisories yeah, exactly. or heating their homes with Not firewood. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, uh, again, I don't want to harp on this because there's people who, who really need help, and that's the thing that we, we should focus on right now. But this is a deregulation issue, right? These utilities were not forced to spend money to prepare for temperatures this cold because it does, obviously it doesn't usually get this cold in Texas. Uh, so they didn't do that, and this is what you get. Uh, but meanwhile, I mentioned this uh, a minute ago, winter storm warnings plastered across the northeast today. This is sort of the remnants of that, uh, that Texas storm now headed north. Um, New York City is in the thick of it. We're looking at, I think, nine to 10 inches here oh. in the big town uh, it, by the end of tomorrow. It just never stops. Yeah, so. uh, it does. This is a bad winter, you know? Like, we, sort of, we sort of should have not seen that coming, right? Everything has just sort of been kind of like the worst case scenario. <laughs> right, this, yeah. Last year or so. Uh, the good news here is that the whole country is looking at a significant thaw this weekend, um, and that's forecast to stay around through the end of February. So this could really be winter's final act if we oh. can get through these next few days and get these people down south their uh, electricity back. I hope so, Carlo, because the photos you see of what's happening down south of uh, families huddled in their cars is just, it's apocalyptic and it's just awful what's happening. And the concern again is hopefully, uh, you know, we learn what the lessons of what happened in Texas because this is gonna potentially be an issue for the foreseeable future, Carlo, as we see these volatile uh, storms across the country everywhere. We're going to have hot summers, cold winters. People are going to be uh, turning up their air conditioners in the summer, cranking up the heat in the winter, and that's going to put a lot of stress on these power grids all across the world. And so there's a big concern about what that's going to be like in the, in the for, for, yeah. foreseeable future. 
By by the way, the, this crazy weather. It's not. I mean, first of all, like it's it's winter, right? Obviously, like it gets cold a, in winter. So, but it is true that you're seeing things that you don't usually that you didn't used to see. I mean, the Acropolis in Greece under a blanket of snow. Saudi Arabia. It's I know. snowing in Saudi Isn't Arabia. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you the know, photos this is the in future, Saudi guys. Arabia are crazy. Like I've never ever seen <laughs> camels, yeah. palm trees, snow. You know, <laughs> like it's crazy just to think. And by the this way, is the future. Dallas, Texas. I, I I used to spend summers in Dallas, Texas, visiting my dad, and. It, the idea of it being minus two degrees in Dallas, Texas is some, I mean, it's sometimes it gets cold and chilly in Texas because of the humidity, but never minus two degrees. Yeah. So the, the idea of going through that without any power, any heat or any of that and doing that for days on end yeah. is just, uh, it's unconscionable, Carlo, and it's just awful. Let's uh, move everybody up and talk about the COVID headlines that we're following today. Life expectancy in the U.S. Crazy. This story dropping a full year in the first half of 2020. That's no doubt a reflection of the toll of the pandemic. It was the largest drop we've seen in decades and was even more pronounced for the black population. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine suggesting that both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are highly effective against that UK variant, but less so against that one in South Africa. Dr. Fauci now weighing in on that debate over reopening schools as well. He says it would be, quote, non-workable to vaccinate every teacher before schools open their doors to students, Carlo. Yeah, I saw him say that yesterday, and um, I was I was a little bit surprised because, so we there's about three million teachers in America. Um, right. We're vaccinating. Uh, we're doing what? 1.6, uh, I think almost 1.7 vaccinations Correct. a day now. So, I mean, in theory, we could vaccinate. At least you'd think we'd be able to vaccinate all the teachers. And in, in, I mean, the logistics would be difficult, but we could do it. It's not that. It's not not. It's not undoable. Um, I'm not really sure why we aren't. Probably because we don't really have like a you know a federal vaccination campaign and it's all the state by state stuff but you know the school issue it's it's such a thicket and I've, I've said before that you know to me the harm being done by not opening schools at this point is probably more than the harm if we do reopen them just given what we know about tr transmissibility among young people and in schools but you know that's really easy for me to say right I'm sitting right. here in my in, in my apartment I haven't been inside a public school building in probably 19 years um so I respect that a lot of teachers listen to that and they feel very differently. Um, I really do respect that. This is a this is a hard this is a hard one. Uh, but something has got to give here. Um, you totally. know, there's no such thing as as, as zero risk tolerance. Uh, and and I, I don't know. I just keep hearing these stories about these kids losing their minds uh, trying on on trying to have Zoom classes. I mean, oh, my niece and I, nephew it's not are, are like depressed. Yeah, yeah, my parents talk about how my niece and nephew are 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 starting to you know. Uh, be, become really distant and I mean who knows they're kids right but it, it, it's hard not to put two and two together right it's like totally. th these kids are not meant to be uh, taking classes over zoom for a year now the, Carlo, it's this hard, is why, man. This is why this is why now health officials are saying potentially we might see summer schools now because the risk and the concern of of kids not being in class and learning at their full potential, how is that going to, is that going to be a major detriment to them as they get older? I mean, that is, yeah. that is learning that you don't get back. And kids aside, think of the parents and all of this. Carlo, you have a kid coming here sometime soon. I mean, this, yeah. I mean, I can only imagine how exasperated parents are. And this is why this is going to become a hot button political issue. And this is why now we're seeing Joe Biden sort of now fighting with his own CDC, essentially trying to walk this fine line of appeasing the teachers unions who clearly right. want to vaccinate their teachers before they go back in because they want to be safe. But also you're having to deal with parents that want to get their kids out of the house house. I, I don't know what's, how this is going to, what's going to happen with this, Carlo. I really don't. And this is a tough position no matter what side you're on. Yeah. And I just want to say one other thing. I mean, it, you know, you can't talk about any of this without appreciating. I mean, we as a country do not care about our, our, our public school teachers. Let's just be honest. Right. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a mark on oh, yeah. our society that it, that, that, it's just a fact. I mean, we don't prioritize. Just look at how they're paid. Look at how they're treated. Um, so I want to. I just want to make that clear. But at the same time, like I said, I mean, the, the, this is a real. This is a real problem, and we we really. 
I don't know. I have, I've got nothing else to say about it. It's just so tough. Well, let's move on to our next topic, and let's talk about Rush Limbaugh here, uh, a towering figure, no doubt, in American conservative media who ushered in the era of political talk radio. He died yesterday at the age of 70. Now, his wife actually announced his death of lung cancer on his radio show yesterday, which, by the way, has been on the air since the 1980s. And Carlo, even more insane in this, his show had a 20 million, uh, he had 20 million daily listeners really at its peak. I mean, that is still incredible in this environment, even to have millions of people turning in every single day. On the right, Rush Limbaugh has been heralded for his singular influence on modern conservative politics. However, on the left, he has been denounced for amplifying conser uh, conspiracy theories, birtherism. Uh, he coined derogatory terms like feminazi out there. I remember a few years ago, uh, he rightfully was condemned because he was saying women who take birth control were sluts. Um, I remember as a very young closeted kid, listening, hearing Rush Limbaugh mock uh, people who had HIV and AIDS, yep. who were dying from HIV and AIDS, and that is something that I will remember for the rest of my life. But on the flip side, Carlo, there are people out there who, who champion Rush Limbaugh because he spoke for them. He was a voice for a lot of people in this country. And when we look at live listeners or live viewers of anything, whether it's Rachel Maddow, Tucker Carlson, the, the nightly news on NBC, getting more than a few million people on a sing, on, on listening and, and tuning in on a, a regular basis is a very, very big feat. And Rush Limbaugh did that for decades and decades and decades. And that is something I, I don't know if we'll ever see ever again in this industry, somebody that commands that much power and that much listening authority. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, if you ask pretty much any Republican of our vintage, of sort of like uh, elder millennial, maybe like Gen X, um, if you ask any of them basically how they formed their views, I, I think almost everyone would say that Rush Limbaugh was part of Absolutely. that, at, at least. Uh, he was a visionary. Whatever you think of him, he saw the future of conservatism before anybody else. Uh, he was really the precursor to Donald Trump. Uh, he was really the precursor to Fox News, uh, which was the precursor to Donald Trump. Um, but so even if you think, as I do, uh, that what he did was bad for America, for all the, the reasons that you just mentioned, uh, especially things like having a recurring segment on his show mocking gay Americans who died of AIDS, which is something that he did, uh, you cannot die that he did it. Uh, so you, can't, you cannot deny that he did that. And he mm -hmm. was influential at least – so far as sort of like just defining the modern conservative project. And look what he spanned, um, and look what he spanned. Yeah. And, and, and because of what he created, think of how many conservative talk show hosts were basically created from him. Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, mm -hmm. all these individuals basically came after Rush Limbaugh. I mean, Rush Limbaugh was such a powerful figure. If you tuned on Fox News yesterday, it was rolling Rush Limbaugh tributes all day. He got President Trump, Carlo, who hasn't given a television interview at all since that. he left the White House. He got President Trump within an hour to go on Fox News yesterday to talk about Rush Limbaugh and, the, and, 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 and a tribute to him. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever see somebody as big and powerful in this in, in media I mean, Howard Stern, in, in many ways, completely different, obviously, from a political standpoint, but in terms of the command that they have on our yeah. culture in media, I don't know if we're ever going to have a, as powerful of a figure as a Howard Stern, a Rush Limbaugh anymore, just because our our content and our, and our platforms are so fragmented now. People are watching right. things on so many different platforms now. I don't think anybody's going to command the attention like a Rush Limbaugh did. I I, I did see a clip of, of Trump calling into Fox yesterday uh, to talk about Rush Limbaugh. But, of course, the first thing he said was uh, – talked about the election and how yes, Rush did. thought yes, that, uh, that – yeah. So I'll just say this, Baker. If I, God forbid, were to pass away and you were going to go on Cheddar and give me a uh, oh, you know, the best a, a tribute – Yes, don't talk about yourself, right? That isn't that like the first, yes, the, yes, the yes. first lesson in, in eulogizing somebody. Uh, but that would that's all the more reason, Carlo, your tribute would be even better because I'd be talking about myself the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Carlo, today, by the way, good news. 
a big moment of truth today. If all course goes according to plan, NASA is going to land the spacecraft that they have on Mars today for the fifth time ever. The Perseverance rover is going to arrive at the Red Planet with a touchdown scheduled for 355 Eastern time today. But first, the rover will have to go through what NASA calls seven minutes of terror. This is they try to enter the atmosphere and even land this thing in just one piece. That is incredibly difficult to do. Now, unlike past landings, the Perseverance is targeting a deep crater, a dangerous spot, but one that will give it its best chance to begin its search for signs of microbial life. Uh, Carlo, that seven minutes of terror is fascinating because the delay from those in NASA communicating and, and, and working with that rover uh, uh, spaceship there is a seven to 11 minute delay between the two of those things. So like, just imagine sort of like you sort of communicating and taking almost 11 minutes to get to the row for spacecraft right. is incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's far away, right? I guess that's that's how it works. Um, but the landing attempt, yeah, this is all going to be broadcast live today on NASA TV. If you want to watch that live stream, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll link to it in the newsletter this morning. So it'll be cool. You'll watch these guys in mission control, and they'll, they'll, they'll hopefully be jumping up and down as they uh, hopefully land this thing in one piece, as you said. So if you got nothing to do at 4 p.m. Eastern today, um, you know, Turn it on. It'll be it'll be cool to and, see. This is you know it is monumental to be able to do this kind of thing. Even though they've done it a few times now, uh, this is the this is gonna, this is the biggest one yet. This thing has a helicopter on it. They're going to try and launch this helicopter, try and get some really cool pictures of the of the the Martian terrain. I think it's the first time we'll be when they send images back, we'll be able to actually hear right. um, the audio from what it sounds like. I assume it's probably going to be pretty quiet, but I guess we'll see, right? Carlo, the next phase of space exploration is going to be so exciting. Not just the fact yeah. that we have NASA essentially going to Mars. By the way, we should note the Chinese uh, and the Saudi Arabians also basically. Uh, the Emirates, flying, yeah. Yeah, or, sorry, yes, thank you. Also sending out their own sort of a cruise to, to Mars as well, basically around the same exact time. Uh, in addition, you have Elon Musk's SpaceX, you have Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, you have Virgin Galactic. The next phase of space exploration is so exciting just to see what's gonna happen. Uh, and listen, you know, they're, Elon Musk believes we're gonna be colonizing that planet Mars in the not so distant future. If anything, he believes that's gonna be the next planet we're moving to because we've damaged this one so much. So it's going to be exciting to watch what happens coming up next, Carlo. I have no interest in living on Mars. No, I hear it's really, I hear it's a little warm. <laughs> yeah. I, hear the the moon, I hear the climate's that nice. I, I, I'm down with staying on Earth. We just got to sort of like fix the problems that we have created here. But uh, that being said, I appreciate I appreciate what Musk is doing. And you're right. It, it is um, all of this stuff. Is, it, it, the just uh, it's, it's amazing when you think about it. By the uh, way, the, the, thing, the innovation, the thing I am waiting for the most, because, you know, he knows this answer uh, is. Donald Trump knows if there's, you know, out, you know, alien outer aliens that are living in outer space. He knows that because he's been getting that in terms of his uh, his confidential briefing and his memos. So my my curiosity is when will Donald Trump leak out, you know, in, on whatever parlor or whatever? If is there some sort of uh, living beings outside of this planet? Which well, this is this is a. This is a good rule of thumb for why I don't really believe in most conspiracy theories, because I think that if there was a big one like that, that we were hiding, you think that Trump wouldn't have tweeted that over oh, four yeah. years? <laughs> good that point. I mean, listen, that that's probably, a good, unless yeah. he's saving it, unless he's saving it for like, you know, one, uh, of his, one of his big last moments or something. Yeah, I don't uh, think so. All right, Carla, we don't want to switch gears. I want to talk about the big story that's happening here on Washington and obviously the story that we're going to be focused on the most here on Cheddar. Today on Capitol Hill, big stuff happening where Keith Gill, the day trader known as Roaring Kitty on Reddit, he is going to testify before Congress as part of the hearing on the GameStop short squeeze that happened just a few weeks ago. Also, the CEOs of Reddit and Robinhood also going to testify, and the hearing is expected to touch on the trading limits that Robinhood uh, instituted as shares of GameStop and those other meme stocks took off as a result. Nobody knows, Carlo, how this is all going to play out. By the way, we should also mention Melvin Capital is going to be there. There. Citadel is going to be there as well. When we interviewed Maxine Waters a few weeks ago, she uh, said that she wanted a GameStop to be there, but we don't believe that GameStop is actually going to be there today. Uh, this is going to be fascinating because I, watching Congress, always have to talk about technology. There's better sometimes when it comes to the uh, economy yeah. and finances, but Congress always is just so 
pitiful when it comes to talking about technology. I mean, watching them talk to Mark Zuckerberg, it, I want to pull my hair out because they clearly don't understand the questions that they're asking. So basically taking that and, and tying that now to finance, I, I don't know how this is going to play out today and, and if Congress is going to look like such fools today, given the fact that there are so many unanswered questions that we need to know to make sure that what happened to those, uh, to those retail traders uh, just a few weeks ago doesn't happen again. Yeah, so, yeah, first of all, Cheddar will have live coverage of this all day, so you can feel free to dip in and, and check it out. Starting at 12 we'll noon Eastern. Yes, and we'll have live analysis. Um, it probably will be a you-know-what show. However, that being said, this is the House Financial Services Committee. So this they are actually among the, the more better staffed of the House true, committees true. when it comes to, like, serious thinkers who come prepared for these things, at least. Uh, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, Pat McHenry on the Republican yep. side. Uh, you know, these aren't these aren't the total the, the whack jobs that, that, that no, sometimes no. you and see. And we've interviewed at these, at these most hearings. of these people on this yeah. topic and, and they know quite a bit about this. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So I think it'll be interesting to see what Keith Gill has to say. He's, be, by the way, being sued for securities fraud. He plans to tell lawmakers that he never solicited anyone to buy or sell stocks for his own profit. Um, he's technically a securities broker, which I think is why he's being sued. But from what I could tell, all this guy ever did was post screenshots of like his profit and loss statements on Reddit. So I don't really know what they think that he potentially did wrong. It seems a little frivolous to me. Um, I, I personally think it's ridiculous we're even having these hearings, but it could be illuminating, I think, particularly where it comes to uh, Robin Hood and sort of Robin Hood's gamification of day trading. Uh, that, to me, is sort of the, the issue at hand here more than anything else. Uh, definitely more relevant than whatever, like, Roaring Kitty or the Reddit CEO <laughs> can say. But, by the way, what, what is the Reddit CEO going to say? What does oh, he I have mean, to yeah. do with anything? I mean, yeah. Like, I, I just... There again, like I, I asked this to Warren Davidson, who's also a Republican on the committee that's going to be asking questions today. I was like... Reddit, GameStop, they kind of seem like they're the innocent bystanders and in all of this. They were the platform that was used, but like, it's not like they're the ones that are like pumping this, you know, pumping more attention into all of this. They're right. again, just the curious bystanders here. Oh, Lord. We'll All see. right. Speaking of big tech, the standoff between big tech and news publishers, Carlo, took a huge major step towards uh, reconciliation and the a big major step backwards as well in just a span of a few hours yesterday. Google and News Corp announced a landmark deal in which Google is going to make a significant payment to the parent company of Fox News, the New York Post, and the Wall Street Journal to license their journalism on Google's platforms. Now that's a, no doubt a huge win, Carlo, for media companies that have long said that they're just basically giving away their content for free on the search engine, and they've lost tons of money as a result of that. But then this is where things got crazy, Carlo. Almost immediately after that pretty big news happened, Facebook said they would start restricting all users and publishers in Australia from sharing links to news articles. That aggressive move is in response to a proposed uh, Australian law that would essentially require tech giants to pay publishers to link to their stories. Facebook basically saying, we don't need you as much as you really need us here. Um, uh, kudos, by the way, to Google for doing this deal. I know News Corp has been asking this for a very long time, not just News Corp, a lot of other mm -hmm. publishers as well. Um, uh, and my hope is, is because we've seen so many journalists lose their jobs across the country, um, especially at small newspapers like my hometown Denver Post, uh, because of these uh, tech companies like Google and Facebook basically taking their stuff for free and basically and taking it away from them and they're not able to get advertising back on those stories. But then Facebook essentially saying, listen, we're going to do the exact opposite in all of this. My hope is that we'll see more laws like what we're seeing in Australia to really crack down a lot of these companies, Carlo. You know, Facebook never turns down an opportunity to do the wrong thing. You almost have to hand <laughs> it to them. It's it's True. it's really incredible. Um, the the platform, first of all, Facebook is utterly broken as it is, right? Because of just how much BS and misinformation is spread on Facebook every day. True. And now they're going to create this giant, gigantic vacuum by sort of like jettisoning real, legit media and publishers and journalists. Granted, this is just in one country, at least for now. But what do you think is going to fill that void? Do you think it's going to be high quality? No, no, no. News it's going to be. Or do you no. think it's going to be QAnon garbage and more of the rest? Hundred percent. Um, so this is, you know, but what this really is is a show of force by Facebook, right? There is sort of like arm twisting, uh, a real time study of these te big tech platforms showing their raw power when it comes to, um, you know, negotiating with governments. So Facebook says, 
oh, oh and rather than actually pay for news, how about we just take it all off the platform and see how that feels? Totally. And the thing is, is like so few news organizations uh, are, are part of these big conglomerates like News Corp, where you can basically haggle and, and, and negotiate with companies like Facebook and Google. Think of these small publishers that don't have that advantage whatsoever, Carlo. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but again, like, the news industry in itself with how much free content that they get online. This is why everybody's moved to the subscription services out there. Uh, it, it's decimated the news industry as a result. Google and Facebook are yeah. really primarily responsible for this. Obviously the changing times where people aren't buying newspapers anymore, but it breaks my heart how many journalists have lost their jobs over all of this, Carlo. Oh yeah, I could talk about this for hours, but I have a feeling most people don't actually care. This is one of no. those like media stories. That, <laughs> yes. that, that, it, Let's but talk about it is something. Actually, it is important. Let's yes. talk about something people do care about. By the way, speaking of what's happening in Australia, I want to talk tennis because Naomi Osaka, my God, she is so incredible. She beat Serena Williams. I can't even believe I'm saying that. She beat Serena in straight sets the Australian Open semifinals, essentially denying Serena her record tying 24th Grand Slam singles title. Now, no doubt, an emotional Serena walked uh, out of her post-match press conference after she was asked if this was her last Open. Uh, I, clearly, I hope. It's not her last open, but Naomi Osaka, she has just God, come yeah. to the tennis world and just completely rocked it the last few years. Yeah, she's incredible. I mean, both of these women are absolutely incredible. Uh, Osaka is going to face Jennifer Brady, the American, uh, in the final on Saturday. Osaka, I believe, plays under plays for Japan, but I believe she's an American, uh, an American citizen, right? Anyway, she's she's technically Japanese, uh, so she's going to face the American Jennifer Brady in the final on Saturday. In men's, by the way, Rafael Nadal he mm -hmm. lost in a pretty epic collapse as Huge we were uh, speaking yesterday. Uh, and Djokovic, let me just double check this. Yeah, he just advanced to the final. Um, oh wow! So it'll yeah, so that's going to be good. But Serena has been stuck at these 23 Grand Slams since she I won. I believe it was the Australian Open in 2017 when she was pregnant, um, which will, in my mind, go down as one of the most uh, unbelievable sports totally. achievements of all time. And by the way, she'll get there. She will get there. I mean, obviously, you don't know how. As an athlete, you never know how long your window of opportunity is, unless you're Tom Brady and you can play till you're 50. <laughs> um, but right. yeah, you, you're always curious how long your window of opportunity is, but you have to think somebody like Serena is going to get there. She's just too incredible and powerful of an athlete so. to not get there. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, okay, let's leave it there. We're going long, but that's okay. Uh, that's what you need to know, guys, for Thursday, <laughs> February 18th. Baker, you and I will do some love, hate, eight tomorrow Can't wait. to end this little week.